good morning. And thank you, Kwame, for opening the event. Um, I think the context around innovation and economic growth is something that um, having an ecosystem to appreciate it, but also having regulators to discuss and share perspective, um, I find to be usually very helpful and insightful. So we're going to unpack FinTech innovation, um, regulation, and also CBDCs. Those are uh, big topics for central bankers right now. And looking forward to your insight um, on some of the questions that I think uh, you are also thinking about and what you're doing, but also the broader ecosystem to understand how a central bank uh, really looks at those issues. So first off, let's uh, allow me to actually let you introduce yourself a little bit. I know you just did a keynote, and then we'll ask your other panelists to introduce themselves as well. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning once again. So my name is Kwame Opong, Director of FinTech and Innovation at Bank of Ghana responsible for licensing and supervision of the mobile money ecosystem, as well as the payment service providers, in addition to all the innovation that a central bank looks to uh, provide on the markets, either internally to support what is happening within industry, or perhaps externally as well to facilitate, to ensure that innovation can progress uh, in a safe manner in, in, in Ghana. So I'm glad to be here, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Bertrand? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Bertrand Ngengoma, and I'm the uh, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer uh, at the Central Bank of Rwanda. Uh, I am, me and my team, uh, we are responsible uh, for the uh, uh, Central Bank IT ecosystem that supports the, uh, the bank's businesses uh, for inter internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. Uh, when I talk about ecosystem, I'm talking about applications, infrastructure, and security. Uh, thank you for the invite, and I'm looking forward to, uh, towards this conversation. Yeah. Sounds good. So let's kick it off. Uh, you talked about fintech for economic growth. Maybe we can start with you, Beltran, if that's okay, given your uh, keynote. Uh, how has fintech impacted the Rwandan financial market? Thank you. Uh, uh, so fintech... So we have to first, let's first talk about our, our uh, central bank mandates. I um, uh, believe uh, uh, the Bank of Ghana as well. Uh, we talk about um, um, uh, financial stability, uh, we talk about consumer protection, uh, and uh, oh, those are the main two pillars uh, that, uh, that drive, uh, that we think about when we are uh, talking about FinTech, right? So. Um, if you, if, you, if you look at the uh, traditional ways of financial services, FinTech has uh, completely, uh, completely changed how we look at financial services in terms of customer satisfaction, right? There's conveniency, there is, uh, uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fast, it's cheaper, uh, and, um, and uh, that's what we look at in terms of uh, customer satisfaction. So, it has, uh, uh, when, when, FinTech, when FinTech is supported with, uh, with accurate uh, data points, uh, we, uh, we, we know that it answers, it answers uh, the customer's uh, needs. Uh, and like uh, uh, Kwame mentioned at, the, uh, at his opening remarks, we have seen that uh, FinTech services actually help us on our mandate of financial inclusion, right? Uh, it, it reaches uh, a lot of people, uh, it reaches uh, different genders, uh, different class of life, etc., etc. So we have, we are, we are, we are conscious that FinTech is helping us into, uh, into, into reaching our, our, our mandate of financial inclusion. Um, for instance, mobile money, uh, how mobile money uh, today, um, it has, it has reached 77% of, uh, of, of our population. Uh, that also has influenced, uh, has also influenced uh, people to get, you know, smartphones, to, to get access to internet. Uh, and, uh, and we have seen that it's, it's, it's pushing, it's influencing the population to actually uh, uh, participate in the, financial, in the financial market, which is what we want. Um, Another thing, also fintech, um, has also pushed us to see uh, to see what we are lagging behind, right? Uh, 
So when we talk about fintech, we look at the regulations in place, uh, in place regulation and policy, uh, and it has pushed us to see where our strengths today, uh, currently, and our weaknesses, right? And today in Rwanda, we are we have uh, at a central bank, we have um, we have uh, we have uh, we are working on a fintech strategy, right? A central bank, and then also at a national uh, at a national level, they are also working on a fintech strategy. Uh, with different stakeholders, key stakeholders in the, in the government institutions. Uh, so we're working on a strategy on how we can fully support FinTech, how we can uh, incorporate agile thinking in our regulation and policies because a FinTech and innovations are, will always be agile. So today we're talking about FinTech, we're talking about CBDC, uh, AI, etc. but tomorrow it will be something else, right? So we, we understand uh, the, the, the importance of, of, of FinTech, we understand that it's actually supporting us in the mandates we're trying to reach. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we understand and we are, we are committed, we stay committed to, uh, to, to, to support the FinTech industry, yeah. Well, so many great points. Kwame, do you want to add to that? Yes, so I think um, Bertrand has pretty much touched on many of the points. But I think for starters, the audience in the room should pay attention to the fact that now what you're seeing across the continent, and frankly, it's happening in the Middle East, it's happening in Latin America, it's happening everywhere else, there's a bit of a shift, even within the central bank, in terms of the skill set and capacities being brought in. I was excited to meet him for the first time, um, because I do know what even having a chief technology officer and innovation officer <laughs> would do for the Central Bank of Rwanda. Rwanda is one of our sister uh, countries with an incredible potential in a dynamic market environment. And it just goes to the point that there is a change in the conversation. There is an appreciation in what lies in FinTech for us as a continent. Now, last year I made an important point, and that point goes to what he mentioned. As a Central Bank, our mandates will not change. Beyond the innovation, we still have to ensure financial stability, we still have to make sure that the market is resilient, we still need to make sure that, of course, monetary policy is, is firm. We also need to make sure that consumers are protected. And so often, we have a multifaceted responsibility, whereas mostly our stakeholders might be looking perhaps at one dimension. But what we try to do, and what you will find value, which I'll reiterate from the first event is, Collaboration and engagement is very useful. Some of the things that we're doing today, in fact, tomorrow there will be a workshop, a master class on governance that many fintechs perhaps might not even realize that governance is not a requirement for, from a central bank only. Governance is for you. It is protecting your investment. It is ensuring that your business will be viable long term. It is ensuring that there will be confidence from an investor standpoint in investing in your business. And these are some of the things that if we start engaging, we start to appreciate more. And so zoning out of that, we zoom out of that and look at the market today. Regulators are really pivoting to look at where the barriers are, at least what can be resolved now, what can be addressed to make sure there can be progress to try to address those. And so in Ghana, for instance, we work with industry to put in place a regulatory framework um, for instance, it's surprising that many people did not know we have a license category with no capital requirement, very minimum requirements, frankly. In fact, we have two license categories with no capital requirement. And there's one dedicated to the early stage startup. And people did not know it. Now, shame on us on one side, because I think we also communicate through very formal channels in our suits and with very carefully worded language. But we're trying to find that balance to try to communicate a bit differently through additional channels to make sure we're reaching our audience. But many of those who are now finding out that these opportunities are there also owe it to themselves to engage a bit more. It's amazing to people when they actually come and we welcome them. You know, we have, we have for instance, tools online to allow you to book meetings, to engage us, to have conversations. We've worked on putting in place a sandbox, and I'm excited about the innovations that will be announced uh, sometime soon. These are just inspiring to see what young and not so young Ghanaians have actually put in place and the impact it can have long term. We need FinTech to be successful. We need innovation to be safe. 
so that we can all benefit from it. It is in our interest as much as it is in your interest. So much as we are trying to do what we can, it is important that you engage us more. Perhaps you have more insights into the consuming public. You have more insights into the behavior, preference, needs of consumers. We don't deal with customers on a daily basis. If we can find that middle ground to collaborate in addressing the opportunities that you see, it's beneficial for everyone. So I just wanted to use this also as an opening remark, encourage everyone to really invest themselves in engaging not just the central bank, but all the key stakeholders so that we can really advance the agenda of fintech promotion here in Ghana and across the continent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. I mean, between both of you, some key words that I picked up, you really making the case, which I think is not often uh, discussed pretty loudly, of how much central bank actually can also benefit from fintech innovation for their mandate. Um, and the mandate of the central bank to provide financial stability across um, and realizing that the central bank does not provide consumer products directly. So you, you really rely on that private sector layer in order to, to effectively implement your mandate and to successfully get there. Um, but you also use terms like agile um, and fintech innovation office and kind of how you're starting to think about strategically how fintech uh, will align with your, with your goals. What are some trends in fintech that you are seeing right now that you think will start uh, not only help with the mandate, but more broadly what consumers are very interested in? Whoever wants to start. Okay, sure. Um, so there are a couple of things happening. Right? That's what we're seeing today and what we're seeing perhaps into the future. Today we're already seeing some innovation around buy now, pay later products, which I mean, let's face it, right? Being able to buy things and pay installments has been long overdue in our countries. Right? Our, our, our counterparts in even more advanced economies are paying less or at least the ticket at which they have to acquire very basic consumer products is much lower than ours. Look at all the devices in your hands. You probably have to pay full price for it. You could have paid an installment. So we're seeing some innovation around credits. I mean, the fundamental, the core product is credits. So whether it's buy now, pay later, SME lending, et cetera, we're seeing that happening. We're seeing some innovation around payments as always, right? Simplified mechanisms, the leveraging of new innovation and solutions. And frankly, we're also seeing more consumer tools being embedded in products. So, and automated tools such as, you know, AI-enabled solutions. And these are things that we encourage. And we're also seeing some of these things, by the way, come from banks. So not just those of you in here. I'm sure there are some banks in here, but normally this is not something you'd expect coming from traditional banks. We're seeing that happening. We're also seeing something that is really near and dear to my heart, which is collaboration. I think over the years we had somehow erroneously assumed that it's a zero-sum game. If a fintech is winning, a traditional player is losing. No, go and look at the fintech data, uh, the, the Findex data. The global Findex survey has shown consistently that even as mobile money was growing tremendously in Ghana, bank accounts was growing along with it. Because you're ushering people into the formal financial sector, they need more enriched services and an expanded scope of products to address their financial needs, and so they come into the banking sector, they become your joint clients. And this is encouraging from banks to savings and loans and microfinance institutions to partner with fintech to build products and services. And we're licensing them every day, we're authorizing products every day, and this is encouraging to see because sometimes you may not see the impact, but for us as a central bank, we often go into the ground, into the field to see what's really happening and to hear the conversation. They don't know who we are, where we're from, and you get that feedback. That is evidence of that economic impact we're looking for. That is the reason why we do this. And then perhaps looking into the future. Some may wonder why we even are doing CBDC. And you know, there's all kinds of misconception, what it is, what it's not. Let's be very clear about something. CBDC is currency. And by currency, I mean not just a digital or virtual asset, but currency in its legal status and form, which is something that only a central bank or state mandated institution can actually offer it. The problem is, as we are putting all these policies in place so that digital financial services can grow, we, are, we could be neglecting the fact that someday in future, we will be the source of an efficiency because we're providing you with a physical form factor of money 
that is not applicable and relevant in a digital world. How then can you go from fiat into that world in a seamless manner? It means we will become the problem someday. So given that we have a certain mandate, given that we have a certain responsibility, and given that we have an interest in promoting fintech and digital financial services more broadly, it became important that we also explore CBDC so that, as we position in Ghana, by the way, we look at the ECD as an enabler of the ecosystem. Now, not all of you may have had the opportunity to see what happened in a, in a pilot, and there will be a report coming out for you to see someday, soon. But one significant thing is, we never put out a Bank of Ghana app. If anyone saw it in here, I'll be shocked. None of you saw it, but there was an app. It was internal to BOG. The reason is we had private sector providers, some of whom may be in this room, who were actually part of the process, integrated in the CVDC system, and provided it as a service to their customers. This is no different from our Monday today, because when we print currency, and we make it available to commercial banks who distribute it, that's it, you provide products and services on the back of it. So we positioned ECD and our CBDC as an enabler of the ecosystem. And someday, people are gonna have the opportunity, fintechs, banks, and everybody else, is gonna have the opportunity to plug into these systems and build more innovation on top of it. Secondly, there was a dimension that was important for us. If we, as a state-mandated institution, issue currency to everyone who lives everywhere, how could we then introduce currency of the future and neglect those who live beyond the last mile? Because remember, for all the success we tout, when you go to that last mile where the last cell tower ends, there are people who live there, farmers, traders, fisher folk, who do not have access to cell connectivity, whether voice, data, or anything at all. And so one of the things we're able to do successfully is to ensure that we could, we could test an offline version of the CBDC. And look, offline payment has been there for a while. I think going back to perhaps the late 90s, early 2000s, that's not what I'm talking about. It's the ability to make consecutive payments amongst yourselves in an offline environment. So it's digital, but it's still offline. This may seem as an interesting technology exploration. No, it's not. Take a step back and think through it. Now that farmer, who today, objectively speaking, is buying rice, is buying farm implements, is buying fertilizers, is buying all kinds of goods and services, but somehow their transactional footprint is not being documented, cannot get access to a loan based on their transaction history. However, had they been doing this digitally, whichever bank fintech or service provider who chooses to engage them now can get access to data, obviously, with the proper consent and the proper governance around that. When they authenticate and give you their data, now you have a wealth of data to score and lend to them. Provide them savings products. Provide them insurance products. That's how to actually impact financial inclusion. And so all around the world, there was a question of what is the real link between CBDC and financial inclusion? Here's a classic example not just giving people accounts because it is possible, but creating that market linkage, which also for you as service providers is a tremendous opportunity to explore. And so for us, everything we've been doing has been carefully calibrated to achieve a certain end goal. And that's another demonstration of how we think not only can we drive FinTech and innovation, but we can also enable it in future in a way that changes the, the impact and the potential for us as an economy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Bertrand, go ahead, please. What are the, some of the fintech trends you're seeing? Yes, uh, thank you. Kwame uh, pretty much has uh, spoke about uh, uh, the trends. Um, he's talking about the front end, right? Front end impact and uh, and uh, I think we've, we, 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 we are pretty much on the same path uh, when it comes to that, but I'm gonna talk maybe about um, one or two um, uh, trends in the back end, right? Um, one of them is big data, big data analytics, right? Uh, as a trend, it has shown us that, um, it has shown us that uh, 
uh, with, the, with the right uh, uh, data point, uh, accurate data sources, uh, it, it feeds into uh, the innovators, um, uh, innovators of fintech to provide the right services and, pro and products to, to customers. But it, also, it has also shown us that it can go be it, big data analytics can uh, can go beyond fintech, right? Um, data is everything. Information is everything. So that's one trend that we have identified that we. Uh, we are, we are actually right now actively working on, a, on another strategy, big data analytics, uh, that's going to help us not only with fintech, uh, with other innovations and uh, other, other, uh, other areas and other industries as well uh, that, that uh, uh, in, the financial, in, the in the financial sector. Uh, another point also uh, is uh, AI technology as well. Uh, we have also seen, even though it's still a, a, broad, a broad subject as well, and we're still um, um, uh, uh, working on some feasibility, feasibility study and, uh, and, uh, and, and strategy on AI as well and regulations, we have seen also how uh, it's a trend that, that can, can, can help us, the country, uh, beyond fintech, so right now we're talking about fintech, CBDC, and et cetera, but we see also beyond that as well in the future. Um, for instance, for, uh, for AI, how it supports um, uh, KYC, you know, you know your customer, uh, profiling of your customer. So all, those are all information and processes that, that, are, that are needed uh, in, in the fintech industry and also uh, beyond, beyond that. So uh, for us, uh, those are the two main, um, uh, two main trends that we are, uh, we are concentrating on uh, that are supporting fin the fintech industry, but also we're looking at how it will support uh, uh, in other areas in the financial uh, sector as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to push you a little bit because this is a money and DeFi summit. No one said virtual assets and DeFi and crypto. So what are your thoughts on that? Put it in your hot seat. I gave a description, you know, when Bethany and I were having a conversation, I said, you know what, you and I have the most interesting jobs in central banks. On one hand, we wear the hat of a policeman, on the other hand, we wear the hat of a cheerleader. So we're gonna shift from our policeman hats and uh, perhaps move to the innovation side. And one of the best- This question, <laughs> you guys- Not quite what is our reality. <laughs> we need to really, you know, I, I think the reality is, look, one benefit that we always will have as innovation functions in central banks is the ability to think and explore things that the central bank doesn't want to see or deal with. That's a very, I think that's probably one of the more exciting parts of our jobs. No one is chasing you about licenses. Nobody's chasing you for approvals. It's all tech and excitement. And look, as it stands internally, I think there are people in here who we've engaged at different levels. And this is why when I say engagement, I really mean it's at a sincere level. We actually internally explore several things. We, for instance, will be announcing some time before the year ends some innovation that we've done with another central bank somewhere in Asia um, in how we've managed to tokenize identities and create credentials out of it. We've internally leveraged, we're exploring things around semi-fungible tokens and the rest. So we're not, we're not unaware of what's happening there. But these are very quiet and sober explorations of things that are happening because we need to understand it. We need to be able to understand it deep enough to be able to disaggregate it and see, okay, where are the problem areas, which if anybody in this room thinks there are no problem areas with either DeFi, crypto, anything, then you aren't really looking at a big, big picture. But we also know there's tremendous opportunity. So even in our sandbox announcement, you may have seen in there that we, in, we introduce language that says blockchain. We're, inter we're interested in seeing blockchain technology as well. And I don't know if many people took notice of that. But look, the future is ABC, right? So you know there's AI, there's gonna be blockchain, there's going to be uh, currency, so either CBDC or, or cryptocurrency, depending on where you sit or where you stand. And then of course, there's the issue of data and analytics, as Bertrand has mentioned. So this is an inherent part of what the future would look like. But when it comes to cryptocurrency and DeFi, it really depends on how it's being applied. Remember, technology is neutral, absolutely neutral. But any time you want to apply technology in a certain context, if that context is regulated, whether it's finance, whether it's banking, whether it's, I don't know, healthcare, whether it's military-related applications, and all those areas that may be strictly regulated, remember, 
society did not determine that these places should be regulated out of nothing. It comes from a history. And even defining what the minimal expectation of what that regulation should look like is a reality that we all live. I'm sure many of you can safely drive more than 100 kilometers per hour on a highway. But unfortunately, the reality is that society makes rules based on the worst performer in the scheme of events. So perhaps people, the worst person can drive up to 100 kilometers, and I'm sure you see them on a highway every day. The rules are made with them in mind not you, the person who's perhaps uh, capable of driving at 200 kilometers. And we have that same obligation. Anytime you hear of a crypto scam, scam, there are many people in the space who feel like, you know what, this is not even what it's about. It shouldn't even happen. If you're really true to the course, this should not even happen. And I hear you. We respect that. We understand that. And we have a very healthy and open engagement at that level. Because we've seen tremendous innovation in the digital assets world Look, when it comes to something as simple as bond issuance, if you look at the process, anybody who's never been involved in that whole security space and bond issuance, go and look at the traditional process and look at what cryptocurrency can do there, or tokenization can do there. You wonder why they even have this, but you know what? It's been built over years. And in future, you're going to see, and it's already happening, securitizing bonds and tokenizing bonds is going to happen in several jurisdictions and eventually, when regulators across the world have the capacity to guarantee consumers a certain level of confidence and protection, certain things will be a problem again. Now, this is where my point about engagement comes in, and this is what I mentioned last year at the event. You have an obligation to engage, to engage and say, you know what, this consumer protection concern you have can be addressed this way. Look at something like a basic KYC utility system that can be blockchain enabled. Who's offering that to any regulatory body across the continent? Who's proposing that context and that concept? Now we have to look at it internally, but it shouldn't have taken us exploring these things to bring it to bear so that someday it becomes one of the tools that gives confidence for the introduction of some kind of digital assets innovation. So we see it, and especially for blockchain, I think if anybody thinks blockchain will somehow disappear, I, I don't know where you're, what you're reading or where you're from, but <laughs> it's, I don't even see it disappearing in my lifetime, and I don't know what else. I mean, look at, look at Web3. All those of you who had to buy tickets to come in here, you probably bought it on an airline or some kind of OTA that is leveraging Web3 and blockchain. It's your reality, whether you know it or not. So the applications are immense, and most regulators are not oblivious to this. We're actually looking into it, we're studying it, how do we take out the part that we don't have concerns about? And let's sit around the table and figure out how we address what we have concerns about. And I don't know at what point we have to talk about certain other things, but this is where you engage us. Um, finally, perhaps let me also make a comment on the idea of whether central banks also are comfortable with crypto or not. At the individual level, and Perhaps Bertrand doesn't want to put this in pub <laughs> in, out in public, but at the individual level, there is that conflict as well. You can like it, but you have to be able to speak to your responsibility to ensure consumer protection and stability. There are differences in monetary uh, policy approaches. So sometimes the full unmitigated exploration or even permission of certain products and innovation on a market could be relatively harmless in one context, but also quite harmful in another context. And so it is not a matter of somehow inherently not liking it. It is a matter of sufficiently appreciating it or perhaps appreciating the potential guardrails that can make it mainstreamed as other payment products and instruments have become today. Do not forget, mobile money recently went through that same journey. And for those of you who went through that journey, I'm sure you have your own experiences around that. It is not inconceivable that someday some of those concerns will also be addressed. But it took proactive engagement and even volunteering to co-create things that can make it possible. So we know it's gonna be part of the future. We know it will play a role. 
Central banks had not even come into the idea of CBDC out of nothing, we know. And this is where, again, we expect the DeFi community to engage a bit more. I don't know at what point we talk about. You can do, well, please do. You know, this is where we actually, even from our CBDC initiative, intend to reach out to your creative potential to co-create more products and innovations so that someday, should we introduce a central bank digital currency, it has a, it has a, a wide breadth of relevant products and services for the consuming public. And so we've been working with MTech over the past, I don't know how long now, it feels like so many months, <laughs> to introduce and announce a sandbox and a hackathon in our sandbox with our eCity. So innovators, and again, you don't have to even be a licensed entity. I repeat, you don't have to be a licensed entity to be able to participate in this hackathon. It is an opportunity for you to not just win some prize money potentially or get some bragging rights, but really help create innovation for the future on that ECD platform. We've seen a lot of potential. We've seen a lot of promise in the CBDC that we've explored, and we want to be able to enlist you to be a part of defining what it looks like in the future. I really encourage you to take advantage of it. I think you would like it. I think you would love the process. It will also bring you a bit closer to understand the other side of the central bank, the less strict and formal part of the central bank, and hopefully bridge a certain uh, relationship gap between us and the crypto and DeFi community out there. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So Bertrand, what are some thoughts when it comes to crypto and DeFi on the East? Um, quickly and whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Yes, well, thank you. Um, uh, Kwame uh, basically spoke about uh, the, whole, uh, the whole picture. Um, there's a fine line. There's a fine line uh, between our uh, fine line between our mandates, right? When we talk about financial stability, consumer protection, and financial inclusion, right? Uh, so a anytime we try to find, we try to support innovations and innovators without compromising uh, one or two or the other mandates, right? Uh, so when it comes to cryptocurrency, uh, DeFi. Anything, anything that, uh, anything that says decentralized, that, 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 that has, uh, that's open for everyone, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, where there's limited or no visibility on uh, transactions, who made transactions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those are things that, uh, 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 you know, for lack of better, t of better terms, uh, that raise, few flags, you know, now on the consumer protection and financial stability part, right? Uh, whether um, financial inclusion is catered for with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with blockchain technology and cryptocurrency, that's also still to be also uh, uh, proven. Uh, but uh, for us, um, uh, again, what we're talking about, about agility in our, in our regulations and, uh, and policies, we, we are aware that innovations are agile and always change, they always evolve. Uh, and uh, and we, we have regulatory sandbox as well, like Kwame was mentioning. We are open to, 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 you know, to test new products, to test new services, uh, and to also learn as well. When, you are, when it comes to regulatory sandbox, it's not just for the, for, for the innovators, it's also for the regulator. Uh, we look, we, 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 we test also our regulations, our policies. Does this apply? Does this really, sh is this really should be here? This, does this policy really make sense uh, in this day and age, et cetera, et cetera? So um, we, we, are, we are open to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to innovation, uh, uh, DeFi, uh, uh, blockchain technology, uh, and, uh, and to, to be quite, quite, quite frank, quite frank, we, um, CBDC was even the thought of the central bank uh, digital currency came up, you know, after uh, there was cryptocurrency out there uh, and they were posing those those risks to the to our consumers. So uh, the central and uh, cryptocurrency blockchain somehow will also cut have to cut off the, the 
I don't want to call the middlemen, but yeah, the commercial banks, the central banks. So that's how one of the one of the main reasons also why uh, central banks are looking at a central uh, central bank digital currency. Um, so it's still uh, it's still it's still out there. We we we, we recognize innovations. Uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, like also Kwame mentioned, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, one technology uh, can work for a specific process, right? Uh, and not work for this other process, right? So we're open and we are, we are, we, we're trying to see where, uh, where each technology fits uh, uh, in what uh, processes and uh, and without compromising again uh, one of the uh, the, the, the mandates that we have. So, yeah, we same feeling as a Bank of Ghana. We, uh, we, we, we if, if if it makes sense to, uh, to, to, to 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 if it aligns to our to our to our to our um, our, our processes, our mandates. Um, of course, we are also agile. We want to also be agile in our policies. Uh, but we do not, we don't want to compromise uh, uh, our mandate as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, makes sense. Thank you for that. So, going into the last question, and then we'll have a few minutes for for Q and A. Um, so, regulatory sandbox, central bank digital currency, CBDC, Web three regulation. Those are really hot topics in central banks right now. That's those are big rocks to have on your desk to tackle. Um, what are some of the objectives, the risks, but also the opportunities that you see in those three areas? And I think in the context of you know, when it comes to CBDC, there are concerns around adoption. There are concerns around why do we need CBDC if we have Bitcoin? Why do we need CBDC if we have stable coins? Very common question. Um, privacy, is this a new government control tool? Um, there are some historical factors across around the globe that give people concern around what technology can enable a central bank to do. Um, and I think you touch well on the role of fintech and helping with the mandate. So the regulatory sandbox, I can imagine, um, would be aligned with that. But talk about some of those fears, some of those concerns, and what does that mean for you as a regulator? Go ahead, Kwame. Thank you. And I think, for starters, let me mention that for us, our objectives are very clear, right? Um, Switching from physical to digital saves us a lot of money. Let's, let's not pretend we don't have a personal incentive in there. We do. Secondly, also recognizing that we could be the source of a limitation could be an issue. In fact, one thing to even add is there are questions such as, well, if we have mobile money, why do we need CVDC? You haven't really looked at it very well then, because mobile money starts from what? Cash, before it's converted to electronic money, before you can operate. Now. What you may not realize, and for those of you who've operated in that space, you know that one of your biggest source of cost is the liquidity management. Only because we only give you a physical form factor of money, and so you're, you have to compensate agents to do some swaps here and there, moving money around, leveraging the banking uh, logistics ecosystem to be able to ensure there's a rebalancing of electronic money and cash. Going from physical to digital is expensive. If we can provide you a digital version of currency from which you can go into any other kind of form of proprietary e-value, you save so much more. So we actually, in our CBDC effort, mapped out the cost savings across ecosystem, the ecosystem, consumers, mobile money, bankers, banks, and fintechs. We also looked at the incentive across board similarly, beyond just financial uh, savings, we looked at efficiencies, we looked at even what it does for competition. Because imagine, right, if you can build a product that is connected into a CBDC system, and suddenly you have access to the entire ecosystem without going to play A or B for bilateral partnerships and they are bluffing you here and there, would you not love it as an innovator? Mm -hmm. This is a major issue. So we think it really lowers the bar, opens up the whole ecosystem, frankly, for whoever can deliver services, in an appropriate manner to be successful. But let's also talk about some real fears. You know, 
I've always likened that issue to, in fact, I, I just position it directly to what kind of country you live in. If you live in a country that is heavily um, being, you know, being overseen by government, whether CBDC or no CBDC, you're still under surveillance. Let's accept that fact. It is not CBDC that will change anything because governments will have access to your financial transactions anyway. But even with that, in a country like Ghana, there's a certain expectation of privacy that is enshrined in the law. And so, similar to cash today, in our CBDC design, you can put it in a bank account and spend it, or you can put it in an offline wallet and spend it. No difference. Again, from a privacy perspective, remember, if today you go and commit a crime and there's a need to find information on you, regulators have the ability to get that information, in fact, law enforcement from commercial banks. So what we try to do is maintain the existing structure. Nothing changes, at least in our perspective. And remember, we are doing the token-based CBDC. So you don't have a central bank account from us directly. We're not going to be managing your accounts at a central bank, no. We print these tokens, and we call them value notes. It's distributed by commercial banks as they do today, except with, without those bullion vans that you know, uh, run you off the road and they come with high security. And then, that's it. It's distributed to the ecosystem and you operate with it. And so, we've ensured that we've balanced privacy and anonymity with the need for law enforcement, and also, of course, we have to protect against AY, uh, AML concerns and the rest. And that balance is already there in today's digital financial service ecosystem. So what the banks are observing, what the mobile money providers are complying with, and what the fintechs are complying with, remains the same standard. Nothing changes. And perhaps finally, even to the idea of whether there's, you know, sometimes you read some things and think, really? This is nothing to do with the reality, right? This is, I think people should take a step back and remember, human beings work in a central bank. They are citizens too. They are consumers too. They respect and would want to protect their privacy too. Even I leading the CBDC project, I'm sure my colleague wouldn't be comfortable if I know exactly what transaction he did at, I don't know, 2 a.m., right? Why would they? or not, even, not to even speak of my bosses. Why would they want me to have access to a console that shows me everything you're doing? These things are preserved. There's no grand scheme anywhere. I can't speak for some other country, but at least for all the countries I've engaged, there's an actual policy objective. H how do we solve this problem with this new tool? That's what we're often thinking of. And so even the fact that we are reaching out to the ecosystem, of developers, innovators, all kinds of young talent to say, we think you have the ideas, we think you understand this dimension a lot more, we just want to make sure whatever we're going to put out there, at least, we're designing the policy, technology, security, and all the other dimensions to be robust, safe, agile, but also enabling for you. And that's why we went through this journey. Now we want to see you bring your innovation into developing it, into seeing how you can scale it, and so our CBDC is built, again, as I mentioned, on the idea of enabling the ecosystem so that you can provide solutions to consumers. And whatever we design, in fact, we even had an external stakeholder advisory group made up of all kinds of people from the crypto world, from the blockchain world, from banking, from fintech, from mobile money, product innovators, researchers, all kinds of people with whom we'll engage openly and frankly about what we're doing to get the right feedback. And I'm sure when the report is published, many of you are going to find it quite interesting. We've shared our experience thus far with other central banks in Africa, Europe, Latin America, and Asia, and we'll continue to learn through this process. And so I think for those who may have certain concerns for us, our objectives have always been clear. We've always highlighted that. Those are truly, I don't know of any re other reasons why we're doing this. <laughs> And if there were others, I would probably know about that. But beyond that, the concerns that we have highlighted or people have highlighted, we've tried to address them. There is an incentive in it for everyone. You saw one of the biggest players at the, two times now at the Stakeholder Forum actually 
lend their support to the idea because they know what's in it for them. So if you haven't seen what's in it for you, then you haven't paid attention, go and read what it actually is. It is not, unfortunately, it is not cryptocurrency and it's not a stable coin, it is fiat. It is basically currency on its own. It is not backed by another currency, it is the equivalent, it is the CD. You have the physical forms of CD, notes and coins, this is only a digital version of those two. Nothing is different. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Beato? Um, thank you. Um, I'll start with CBDC as well. Um, this, is, uh, this is again an initi initiative that the Central Bank of Rwanda has, uh, uh, is undertaking uh, right now at a stage of feasibility study. Uh, understanding the opportunities that uh, CDB, CBDC can bring uh, uh, to the table, but also looking at the risks as well. Um, uh, we look at opportunities such as, um, um, of course, uh, enabling innovation, uh, financial inclusion, which, which is still a subject that we, uh, we're trying to prove in terms of CDB, CBDC, if it actually will reach everyone in the population. Uh, in terms of financial inclusion, um, uh, the fact that, uh, the fact that um, uh, there could be a resilience in transaction, whether there is a, a network outage uh, and all that. Um, uh, now, now, the risks, uh, the risk of CBDC, um, uh, we still have to look at, um, we look at, uh, if you're going, to, if you're going to, uh, to, deploy, to deploy a solution for, for a given problem, uh, uh, at least uh, when we talk about uh, uh, IT solutions, um, uh, you, you try to design the best solution, uh, the best solution for a given problem. And uh, when, you, uh, when you do that, you think of uh, the timing also. Uh, the timing, is, is this the right time? Is this the right time uh, for CBDC, uh, for Rwanda, for instance, right? So those are things that we're still uh, 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 trying to uh, trying to, uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, to get all the you know the, the the accurate points to make sure that you know we are making the right decision on CBDC. Uh, for instance, another opportunity: cross-border uh, transaction. Um, we look at cross-border transaction, but we think of um, today we have a, we have a big uh, a big project that we're working on um, it's actually a, pro a big program it's a digital transformation of the central bank where we are going to transform basically how how, how our central bank works so from uh, from business processes uh, to the people to the skills uh, to to the, to the regulations the policies and, uh, and and the technology that supports all that right so uh, it's a big program that we're working on, and uh, uh, currently on, a, on, a, on, a, on at, a, at the strategy level, we're trying to develop a roadmap. Uh, so when it comes to CBDC, we, we had the chance to uh, to to we had a chance to also uh, visit other central banks uh, in, in terms of benchmarking and understand you know how they stand uh, where they stand when it comes to CBDC. Uh, this country visited in, uh, in Europe as part of the Euro, uh, Euro countries. They are uh, maybe 99.9% uh, rate in term, percent in terms of financial inclusion. Uh, they have 99.9% uh, .9 of everything is digitalized, all the services, not just financial services, but everything is digitalized. So. Uh, everyone in that country has access to, uh, to, to digital infrastructure, has access to all those digital services. I think the only service that is not yet digitalized uh, in that country is divorce. <laughs> so so <laughs> everything, else is, everything else is digitalized. So we asked them about CBDC and they told us, okay, so we are also uh, going through a strategy at the Euro, Euro countries. They're trying to develop uh, the digital Euro. So when we ask them that specific country, what's, are you guys excited about CBDC? Are you, are you, uh, are you, what, what are the benefits that you see about you, the Euro, the Euro, the digital Euro? For them, they're like, uh, other than the fact that we are part of this uh, Euro, Euro countries and that it's a, it's a, it's a joint strategy to develop the digital Euro and that 
maybe it will help us in cross-border uh, transactions. For us as a country specifically, we, are, we do not see any, at this time, any benefit of, uh, central, bank, of central bank digital currency because all our financial transactions from anyone are one click away, one second away. We already digitalized those really, you know, uh, uh, nothing at a time then that, you know. So, you know, it, goes, it got us thinking as well for us, you know. We understand that, like Kwame mentioned, it's not going anywhere. It will eventually happen, right? Uh, but is it now? Uh, does it need to happen now? Do, uh, are we in the right, uh, you know, uh, time to do that? Uh, so, so it's in that thinking that uh, we're still uh, working on that uh, feasibility study. And uh, uh, once it's concluded, we'll, we'll be happy to share uh, our position on, uh, on that, on the future of CBDC in Rwanda. Uh, uh, same thing with AI. Um, uh, we, we, we recognize, we recognize uh, uh, AI technology, uh, but we also look at uh, t every, every technology cannot work in every instance, in every process. Uh, um, we know that AI technology is is uh, is, uh, is 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 better and well utilized in, in like bigger processes that never change. You know, like manufacturing mm -hmm. processes. Uh, that, you know, uh, huge robust processes, but that are you know uh, consistent and never change. Once something changes the process, then there's a problem. I remember I was reading uh, I was reading an article uh, about AI. Um, uh, I think it's in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they were doing an experiment, and, uh, and uh, they told uh, there were three three machines. They told machine one and machine two uh, to talk to each other, to speak to each other. Uh, they went machine one and machine two spoke to each other, and they told machine three to go listen to uh, to what machine one and machine two are uh, talking about and report back. Uh, machine three went, listened, reported back to what machine one and two were talking about. Uh, second leg of the experiment, they told machine one and machine two uh, go back to speak to each other. Machine three, is li machine three is listening to you guys, is understanding what you guys are saying. Make sure machine three doesn't understand what you guys are saying. Then machine one and machine two went ahead and created their own language that none of you know, none of them could uh, could understand. So you understand that it's a it's a it's a, it's a technology that, that that has to be you know meticulously uh, 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 tied to specific processes, uh, and uh, and especially when it comes to uh, to to our consumers uh, and our mandate again for consumer protection. Those are things that we 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 need to understand. And, and, and like Kwame mentioned, uh, we innovation will always come first before we know about it. So we need time to, you know, to, to understand it, to test it, to, before we put it in production. So that's, that's, that's some of the opportunities and, uh, and risks that uh, we have seen in those uh, technologies. Yeah. Sure, I can imagine it's quite a lot to balance, quite a lot to balance. Um, but I think you probably found the first use case that should not be digitized, it's divorce. Divorces. <laughs> Your freedom in a minute or less. Oh, right, right. <laughs> you know, no digitizing the voice. All right, so this is my third panel here, and I always like to open it up. I have uh, something always, something magic always happens, honestly, I think, when you open it up to, to the audience to ask questions. So let's open it up for Q&A now, and I really appreciate you guys as regulators not being afraid. Hi, my name is Samuel Pierre. Um, my question is to Kwame, two questions. Um, what's the roadmap for the CBDs? And um, when you talk about the CBDs and the use case, you talk about mobile money, that the start point is always cash. Are you seeing the CBDC um, as an enabler or you are launching the product um, as a central bank product into the mass market? Um, do you think it would enable the inclusion beyond the last mile that you talked about, the farmers and you know the people who are really offline and you need to access. Um, my second question is on, well, the stable coins and um, crypto blockchain. What is the fear of the government in regulating or giving the access to the innovation that we are seeing offshore? Because bear in mind that innovation is not only, um, is not only Ghana. 
as a worldwide issue. I mean, where you're seeing some of these transactions being terminated um, into some of these platforms where people are settling not via the conventional SWIFT or the, you know, the conventional mechanisms. Um, I think there's a good reason, cost and all of that, but how is the central bank treating that? Because there needs to be harmony. You talk about engagement. How do you intend to engage that community? And if there's also a roadmap um, for any kind of regulation in that community, because bear in mind, whether you regulate or not, it's happening. Thank you very much. I think in terms of the roadmap for CBDC, so we're done with the pilot. I think we completed it successfully last year. We internally continue work on it, but the governor actually mentioned the 111th MPC press briefing that, you know, obviously the economy was dislocated a bit, and it's important that things are stabilized, just from a basic, I mean, even for you as product developers, you don't introduce products in the midst of instability, right? So it's a matter of the timing of when to do that. But even beyond that, I think from my internal work and exploration perspective, as demonstrated by this announcement of the hackathon, we're still doing our work. You know, things that we need to do in preparation for a potential future introduction, so the work continues to go on. Now, in terms of how the mobile money interplays with CBDC, so we're not introducing CBDC any different from what currency is today, in a sense that you will not have a Bank of Ghana product out there. If you have a Bank of Ghana, you're not going to have a Bank of Ghana app for doing payment transactions. You're not going to have that. What you will have, though, is perhaps a fintech app leveraging CBDC. So if there's any competition, it's again back to between the players, not between Bank of Ghana and mobile money players. Uh, in the same way, remember, the idea of mobile money itself is two major components. First is the creation of electronic money, which is a derivative of bank deposits, right? And that was only necessary because these are not banks. They can't take deposits. And so they had to create that derivative, which is the tokens you play with, and then transact with the funds on the side securely. Should anything happen, we can go for that. But the real reason why you use mobile money player A, B, or C is the utility of the wallet. So taking away the e-money dimension is really about the utility of the wallet. And again, we are not providing a wallet on the market, so it doesn't change anything. In terms of the offline use, and we saw this in Sefri Asafo, people who started using it for their own use cases, beyond what we have given them to. And you know, again, as product developers, you know that people really understand your product, or at least it is easy for them to appreciate when they start using it and developing their own use cases. If they don't like it, if they don't understand it, and they don't want to use it, they are not going to go beyond the first use case. So we had a high uh, acceptance in that use case, and we also went for the most difficult use case in the market, which is person to business, merchant payment. It's one of the most difficult products for any fintech in this room, and you know that. But it's also the biggest potential when it comes to financial inclusion and the cashless agenda. Because the majority, the vast majority, over 90% of transactions in Ghana are between individuals and businesses. That's why we decided, why not try it on the most difficult use case? And we saw, see, in fact, we learned a lot from them, from the users themselves in Sefri Asafo, and how they use it, why they use it, the different use cases they wanted to use it for. And this is what has even emboldened us to drive even more engagement, to develop, to work with the innovation community to develop more use cases. And to the issue of stable coins, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, again, blockchain, we've made some public statements on it. And remember, not every token being created is for payment. Look, there are utility tokens, there are NFTs, there are all kinds of tokens. Someone has a cat and a picture of a cat and they've created an NFT with it. What business do we have chasing that? That's not what we're interested in. It's about using it, the application of it. Whether it's AI or anything else, how are you applying it? Remember, there's a book called The Weapons of Math Destruction. AI can be a dangerous tool as well, just like any other tool. Nuclear energy is amazing and the nuclear technology is amazing. If you need, you know, if you're using it for power or to power a submarine, but we also know what that could do if not properly regulated, right? Ghana had a nuclear program back in independence. I understand it's being, it's about to be revitalized, but there's a reason why it went quiet for a while. It's not something you play with. Similarly, you do not, 
it's irresponsible for any, it's not even about Ghana, for any state agency to give comfort to consumers and say, this is safe. If it doesn't have the ability to protect the consumer should something happen. We saw what happened with FTX, which regulator on the continent, by the way, regulators in Africa are part of how FTX got busted. I'm sure you've seen the story on there. It is irresponsible to not be able to give a certain measure of confidence and protection to consumers and yet tell the public, this is fine. Do not be fooled, we see what's happening. We see transactions as well. Now there are enough tools around the world. Frankly, if there's any crime that occurs, today you know that can be intervened in by state agencies with support by some major service providers around the world. So when you see a purposeful balance of regulatory enforcement application, it is by design, not by a lack of capacity. Because if we decided to crack down, would it be difficult? It would absolutely be a terrible investment of our time and it would be so much commitment, but it will stifle the sector even more and restrict certain things. And so, for instance, to protect the banking sector for now, to protect some payment service providers, we say stay away until there's clear guidance on whether or how you proceed with this space. It doesn't take away the fact that I probably speak with more people in the crypto world today on a weekly basis for whatever reason. They are reaching out a bit more lately since the last DeFi summit than I may with some other segments that I used to interact more with because we are consistently trying to understand. Internally, we also try to test it, develop you know, issues from these tokens just from a research perspective on the innovation side. But AML is a big concern for us. Innovation is great, there's so much excitement, but let me ask you a simple question. Should we go on a blacklist because we couldn't put the right framework in place? What do you think it does to the broader economy? Now you have your innovation and you're excited, but what does that do to the rest of the economy? That humble farmer who exports his, his produce abroad, and now because of de-risking, the cost of his exports and receiving his money has become exponentially high and prohibitive. You've impacted them. If we start listing the fallout, you will begin to see that it is not an inherent dislike. No, there are many who are fascinated by the technology. It's the ability to give assurance from a mandate perspective to the ecosystem for you to say it is safe and say this is the licensing regime. There should be clarity in how you address certain issues. This is why I encourage engagement every time. And we've made progress even in our exploration of how it can be regulated. And we share some of that with some sister central banks who today have actually proceeded with allowing stable coins on the continent, largely because, again, of also their monetary policy regime and the nature of their currency framework. And so they are much better positioned to immediately implement that. So AML issues, consumer protection issues, I was very disturbed and look, Sorry if it breaks your heart, but what was happening with WorldCoin in Kenya, I was very concerned about it. Because many people were not going thinking, I am, taking, I am giving my biometrics so that I can do X, Y, and Z. There's money to be made. And so, what do I care about my biometrics for today? But there's a certain long-term implication. There's a risk behind it. So, this is a consumer protection issue. And there are those who think you go into cryptocurrency, buy Bitcoin, and you are rich tomorrow. They do not know you can be a millionaire today and a pauper tomorrow, right? We all know that the volatility can be there. Stable coins have shown themselves as an important evolution in the crypto space to support with things like cross-border settlement. And you're seeing several countries accept it in how they implement it. But not every jurisdiction has the full capacity yet. There's a bank who probably in Ghana has the capacity to hold stable coins and use that to settle but you don't make rules for that bank alone. You make rules for every bank. Remember what I mentioned? Rules are made for the worst possible person in the equation. There's another bank who will probably lose all their stable coins in a digital vault before you know it, and now you have a problem on your hands. So it's really a matter of stability, and that's why engagement, often the solutions come from you. Engaging to understand the problem and perhaps help resolve it, in some instances, profitably for you as a business, that is the way forward. And that's my advice, not just for the Central Bank of Ghana, but for every regulator you're dealing with on the continent. 
But thank you for that question. Okay, I think, oh, there are more questions. Do you have time for more questions? Okay, all right, one more question, very quick answers. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Achigonye Jompo. My question is for Mr. Kweme and is around the infrastructure that is guiding the CBDC. So what kind of infrastructure is it built on and does it have a total supply? What? A total supply. Can I hear a word? Total supply. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Remember, Central banks issuing currency is not similar to digital assets and virtual assets. So obviously, Bitcoin has a finite supply, right? But as a central bank, we conduct monetary policy. We determine how much money is supplied in the economy and how much we pull out to maintain the value of our currency. So that's why I was very careful to distinguish CBDC from cryptocurrency. It is not. And so we can create money as we deem appropriate within the context of our monetary policy framework. Similarly, we can also control the amount of cash in circulation based on monetary policy tools that we implement. Um, but that process, and again, we didn't build or we have looked at as a controversial part of our decision we've made, and I'm seeing certain countries move in that direction as well. We love the idea of blockchain and what it can do for the CBDC space, but we did not test the issuance of CBDC itself on a blockchain for now. There are some central banks, I think there are two schools of thought. It is a security instrument, and so to choose a blockchain technology, you have to be comfortable with it, and on the other hand, you could also look at a non-blockchain issuance model but I think we're beginning to see enough innovation and robustness and capability around the blockchain issue one's part. But even with that, there should be the flexibility for a central bank to define that without being constricted to what is inherently developed at the beginning. So there isn't a limited supply when it comes to that, unfortunately. It cannot be, it's, a cur it's currency and it's a central bank mandate. Thank you. Okay, so I think this is going to be the last question. Allow me to close by saying that this was a very insightful conversation, and I hope the broader audience enjoyed the answers. You went into depth um, about what you do and some of the key topics that are top of mind. Um, allow me to say that it is a pleasure for me and for MTech to work with Bank of Ghana on the regulatory sandbox um, as helping the digitization of what you do. And I think after this, there will be, we'll be sharing the broader announcement around the ECD hackathon that MTech will be, uh, has partnered with Bank of Ghana to launch. So I hope you stay around and uh, the booths are outside if you have any questions as well around infrastructure or anything uh, that has to do with the ECD hackathon. Thank you very much for the time and thank you for coming to town and uh, having this conversation with us as well. And good luck with all your new endeavors and their projects. Thank you.